I think I'm effective. People do want change in this city. The neighborhoods of West Seattle and South Park are seeing a lot of growing pains. What are the top priorities for residents there? We are moving more people out of homelessness. Both candidates weigh in. We are seeing a rise in property crimes. Just stopping by. The race to represent District 1. In the neighborhood today. Next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. In an election season where seven out of nine Seattle City Council seats are up for grabs, there's a lot of talk about change. That certainly goes for District 1 in West Seattle and South Park, where challenger Phil Tavel is trying to take incumbent Lisa Herbold's position. But Herbold gained more than half of the vote in the August primary, setting up a battle in West Seattle between two opponents who've met before. It's probably going to be that side of the street, right? Lisa Herbold has served as a city council member for four years, representing District 1. I have done a lot for this district, and I want to continue to work for the residents of West Seattle and South Park. More than 50% of those residents voted for Herbold in the August primary, the highest percentage for any incumbent or any Seattle City Council candidate this summer. I think that says a lot about um, how people feel in West Seattle and South Park about their current representation. Herbold, a longtime aide for council member Nick Licata before her election, is endorsed by the Martin Luther King Labor Council, U.S. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, and Emily's List. Hi, I'm Lisa Herbold. I'm your city council member. Nice to meet you. As of early September, her campaign had brought in more than $116,000, with more than 70% of that coming from Seattle's voter-approved democracy voucher program. And she does have money on her mind. The discussion around progressive taxation is not going away. We can just move on to the presentation of the initial balancing package. Herbold championed an employee head tax to put more money into homeless services back in 2017 as the council's budget chair and supported the council's approval of that tax in 2018. Okay, thank you. Though she and the council voted to repeal the tax soon after under mounting public pressure, Herbold says Seattle's hot job market is still providing some pressure too. People are moving here for high earning jobs and are um, pushing out basically folks um, who are lower income. The homeless situation is something that we all need to Definitely. address. But Voters in this district and many others point to homelessness as their top concern. And Herbold says that issue provides a key difference between her and her opponent, Phil Tavel, whom she beat in the 2015 primaries for the District 1 seat. But I do everything I can to involve folks. Herbold says having... Tavel is looking for more efficiencies in our homeless service system. But he's not addressing what she sees as a glaring need for additional funding in order to make a significant impact. I want to work to address the problem in a way that brings more revenue to the table, not just pretend that we can solve the problem with the little bit of revenue that we have available to us now. We're not spending the money well. Tavel, a public defense attorney who's also worked as a physics teacher and video game producer, earned more than 32 percent of the vote in the August primary. A number he says, combined with fellow challenger Brendan Colding's 17 percent, sends a message. People aren't happy with the way the city's going. Tavel is endorsed by the Pacific Northwest Regional Council of Carpenters, Tin Dog Brewing in South Park, and the Seattle Times. And I'm curious if there are any particular issues that you actually have. He's raised more than $110,000 for his campaign as of early September, with about 58 percent of that coming from democracy vouchers. But those aren't the only dollars to keep an eye on in this race. The People for Seattle Political Action Committee, spearheaded by former council member and mayor Tim Burgess, sent out these mailers during the primary campaign opposing Lisa Herbold. People for Seattle is one of three PACs supporting Tavel. It's a little hard because we have no control over what the PACs do. PACs have given Tavel more than $150,000 of support as of early September. PACs have helped Herbold with about 14,000. 
Since 40,000 people didn't vote in August, we're trying to get to those people to say, hey, come out in November. Tavel says he's running a clean race and says voters should focus on which candidate can deliver results. I hope in the general election this is really about change and about the people who want something new and something different that they're going to look to me to be that. Obviously the homeless. When it comes to the homeless, Tavel, like his opponent, supports a regional homeless authority to incorporate county and state assistance. There's so much money going to dealing with it. But Tavel also wants to audit the city departments dealing with the homeless, which he says aren't running effectively. And he wants to provide help for people coming out of jail so they don't end up on the street. We need a transitional program that lets them be in transitional housing that's attached to services to deal with mental health issues and substance abuse issues. Because our biggest thing is we're just failing to help the people that really need the most help in this city. The race for District 1 comes down to an incumbent who's proud of what she's done to help her constituents and a challenger who says she's not doing enough. I want to work together with people to give them faith that their council member is working for them. I mean, my thoughts are that people do want change in this city. And we have both candidates for District 1 with us right now. We have Councilmember Lisa Herbel, the incumbent, and challenger Phil Tavel. Thank you both very much for joining us today. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to start with you. Please tell us briefly why you're running for re-election. Sure. So as mentioned in the setup piece, you know, I believe really passionately in delivering constituent services. That's why I ran when it became a district system. And the Seattle Times has said that I've raised the bar for delivering constituent services in the city. I really believe that when we work on uh, the things that affect people's day-to-day -day lives, whether or not that's fixing the streetlights, uh, getting the potholes fixed, fixing um, some Park um, uh, equipment in mm -hmm. your neighborhood park, mm -hmm. putting in a crosswalk where your kids go to school. Those are the things that when you get that stuff done working with your constituents, your voters know that you're working for them, that they have a voice in City Hall. And through doing that and being successful, um, I think we can really be much more effective on working on some of the city's biggest challenges, okay. like housing and homelessness. And we're going to get into those in just a minute. Absolutely. Phil, same question to you. Why are you running? When my son was about to be born, uh, this was eight years ago now, I thought about the city that he was going to grow up in. And I saw a city with incredible potential that really went unrealized every day. And especially over his lifetime now, over the last eight years, I just have seen a city that can do much better, that we're failing to help the people that need to be helped. And so to that end, you know, I'm just, I'm a 20 year member of the community. Like I said, I'm a father of a second grader, at Arbor Heights Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And I really, and I'm a renter in the neighborhood. And I see the issues with homelessness and affordability and transportation, and that we truly could do a lot better in our city. And I was a physics teacher. I was a small business owner. Mm -hmm. I've been a public defender for most of the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And that's given me a really unique view of where we are failing in this city and the things that we could do much better with. And so in that end, I just want to see a, a city that can really reach its potential. Okay. Let's dive into some of these issues. And Phil, I'll start with you here. I brought up in our setup piece what appears to be a major difference between the two of you with regard to our homeless crisis, which so many voters, as you know, are talking about. Uh, Lisa, you brought up this idea of a more comprehensive response, more revenue. Phil, you're talking about auditing our homeless services system, also creating this transition program for people newly out of jail. If you wouldn't mind starting, Explain your approach to our homeless problem, how it would differ from Councilmember Herbold's. So I think the first thing is we really need to understand what are the results we're seeing from the homeless service providers we have right now. And I don't think we've got a good sense of that. You know, with respect to resources and what they're doing, if you can measure those things, then you can manage it. But I don't think we're measuring them properly, and then you, you can't manage them. So we need to up what we're using the criminal justice system for in terms of a safety net to provide, you know, transitional housing for people coming out of jail who are still homeless. And we need to look at the providers that are not getting the job done. We have so many of them out there, and we're spending so much money on it, but the people just aren't getting helped. And if you talk to a lot of people on the street, they feel that the homeless service providers are the ones that are benefiting, not the people who need it the most. Okay. Uh, Lisa, your thoughts here, your approach to the homeless crisis and how it differs from Phil's. Sure. I don't disagree that we need accountability over the folks that we fund to provide services to our vulnerable populations. Um, but I would say that um, accountability is an ongoing process, and we have made great strides um, in getting that accountability. I sponsored legislation for the council to require what's called results-based accountability. That's the 
design of contracts with outcomes in mind, and then required to me measure the uh, the provider's um, uh, success in meeting those outcomes. And as a result, we've been seeing um, outcomes improve. We are moving more people out of homelessness into permanent housing more quickly than we ever have before. Yeah. And that information is available. It's, yeah. it's There's transparency. We have dashboards both for the city. We get regular reports mm -hmm. to the to the um, the council mm -hmm. um, and also All Home, um, who um, is the regional authority right. that um, also provides some accountability on that work, also has a dashboard that shows okay. all of our outcomes for all of our investments. I, I want to make sure I follow up on one piece with you, though. You were talking about needing new revenue. Why do we need that? Are you talking about another employee head tax? What mm -hmm. are we talking about here with regard to that? So, um, you know, I don't have expertise in this, and mm. I rely on the people who are experts. And okay. so there's a highly regarded regional report called the McKinstry Report yeah. um, that came out last year that demonstrates, provides the data to prove that we need, not just in Seattle, but our entire region, mm -hmm. needs to double our investments yeah. in what's called permanent supportive housing. Right. Permanent supportive housing is the model of housing that when people get into it, yeah. regardless if they have mental illness, substance abuse disorder, um, or physical disabilities, 93% of those people stay housed. Yeah. But we need to have a laser focus yeah. and the political will to fund that housing. Uh, Phil, I feel like there's a response. We're Working here. Are, are you saying that we are spending enough on our homeless response right now? Or help me out with that point because I hear one person talking about additional revenue and you're not. Well, I'm saying what it seems is that we need to spend more money. But before you really get into that, okay. you've got to understand what exactly are we spending now and what are we getting? When you yeah. look at the budgets and what the homeless service providers are getting, what they're spending, it's hard to tell how much money is actually being spent. I mean, you get lots of different numbers thrown out in terms of general mass numbers of yeah. 90 million, 100 million. We need 400 million. We spend, you know, 60,000 a year per homeless, 100,000. Yeah. Right. And truly, until you understand what you're getting for what you're currently spending mm -hmm. so you can get a handle on that, you don't know what the gap is. Yeah. You, and if you don't know what that gap is, then you're sitting somewhere between we have enough and writing a blank check. Yeah. And that's what you can't do. And from the people I talk to, they don't want to see us just continue to throw money at a problem that has just been getting worse and worse and worse. Can I, I want to make sure. Sure. I, 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 can, I, I just want to say, that is, yeah. that's known. That okay. information is known. That's okay. why we have the McKinsey Report. Okay. They have identified okay. what the gaps are based on an, an analysis of what we're spending money on. Okay. I want to make sure I put a fine point on this because this is a big deal for District 1. Camp Second Chance, I'm thinking about, down on Myers mm -hmm. Way. I know it just got that six-month extension after two years plus of being in that location. Phil, maybe I'll start with you. What do you tell the people who are there right now? Are they gonna get another extension past that? Right. Should this be permanent? What do you tell the neighbors there too? I mean, it's really difficult. I know I was at the Highland Park Action Committee yeah. meeting when they talked about it, extending the lease. And you know, you hear from community members that are concerned about the element that gets drawn to that camp, but around the camp, not necessarily in it. Right, right. And the impact and the fact that the city had said when the lease was gonna be there in the first place, that they would get improvements in the neighborhood, that there would be more police, that they would have improvements to the business districts, to the streets. And what I heard at that meeting was none of that has ever happened, yet the city was coming back to say, well, you need to extend it more time. When I've been there and I've met the people in the camp, you see hope, you see a community, yeah. you see people who are trying to transition from a situation that is really untenable to one that's more permanent. And the yeah. people that have gotten out of that have, I think they're doing yeah. great. Yeah, there's there's good numbers to show that as well. Lisa, your thoughts about Camp Second Chance? Sure. I mean, this is a very complicated thing, as Phil yeah. brought up. Highland Park's my neighborhood. Yeah. I really support the efforts of that community um, to leverage their willingness to um, host Camp Second Chance, to get more investments into that community. It's a very underserved community. Yeah. Um, and we have gotten some some <laughs> additional investments yeah. uh, in Highland Park, particularly in the area of bus service, mm. um, commitments to uh, fund um, the uh, the Highland Park roundabout, um, although that's not going to be a project that is wholly um, funded by the city. There's some more dollars but, but, involved there. But yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're working on addressing the concerns of Highland Park um, f around investment about a bunch of different needs. Okay. But in those instances where um, a community is trying to leverage a willingness to host mm -hmm. Camp Second Chance in exchange yeah. for those investments, um, I think that's an appropriate uh, conversation to have, okay. but I don't think it's a reason to 
um, oppose Camp Second Chance okay. if those investments aren't as forthcoming as you would as you would like, because I do think it's been a very successful model. And I think the conversation around that camp is going to continue too. I want to shift if I can, and Phil, I'll start with you talking about the money in this campaign. I mentioned the set of piece. There are a lot of packed dollars in this race. The Civic Alliance for a Sound Economy, the political arm of the Seattle Chamber, has put more than hundred thousand dollars into supporting your campaign. There's been some negative ads. I want to make sure that I talk with you about the influence of political action committees on this race. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's fascinating. You know, I sort of joke with someone that it's kind of like Lisa and I are watching, you know, the Macy's Day Parade on the sidewalk mm. while Snoopy and Garfield are battling out over our heads to see who sits on the council. Mm. And, you know, we, we have no control over what they do. Campaigns are legally barred from having any contact with the PAC. So they raise money and they have an agenda. This agenda for them is to see change and to see someone new yeah. in the seat for our, for our council position. But, you know, when they choose to raise their money and spend it on mailers and spend it on door yeah. knockers that, you know, might not necessarily know that much about me or who I am, yeah. it definitely muddies the waters. Yeah. You know, I get letters from people saying, hey, you know, we've got we've got all these mailers and we're going to vote for you, but stop sending them. Yeah. Or, you know, someone came to our door today and they weren't particularly nice. Why do you do that? <laughs> right, right. And they also think a lot of people that the money comes directly into my campaign, that, oh, they've given me hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, they're also, you know, they're limited to $250. So yeah. that's the support I get from right, them. Right, right. So it's tough. I, I think it really makes it complicated sometimes because people can't distinguish what's the campaign and what's a PAC yeah. and how are they tied together. And it does. Right. It, it actually makes it harder. Yeah. Lisa, your thoughts about this. I know you have some PAC supporting your campaign as well, not to the extent that, that <laughs> Phil has seen, but the largest, the Civic Alliance for a Progressive Economy, CAPE, out there. How do you think PACs are influencing this race or, or others, if you want yeah. to comment on that? I think it's unfortunate because, you know, we voted for district elections because we wanted um, the folks in the district to be the ones who um, mm. are uh, electing their council members. Okay. Um, we voted for democracy vouchers yeah. because we wanted more numbers of people to be involved in politics. And they have been, yeah. And we had 55 and candidates running this right, year, for goodness sakes. Right. Yeah. And so the influence of um, independent expenditure dollars um, are specifically designed to counteract mm. those two really important democratic reforms that mm. this city has overwhelmingly supported. Yeah. It's in direct response. It's yeah. trying to dilute the mm. power of democracy vouchers. It's trying to dilute the, the influence of uh, district elections. And yeah. it's, I, I think it's really unfortunate. Yeah. What is um, more unfortunate to me even than the numbers of dollars, though, is the um, negative campaigning in our yeah. city. It's it, this, These are not Seattle's values to attack people mm -hmm. um, who have um, worked hard yeah. to represent people in our city. Yeah. And I, the, uh, negative campaigning, the function that negative campaigning has is to keep people home, is yeah. to keep people from voting. That is yeah. the result when negative campaigning occurs. And I would um, ask... Uh, Phil, to I, I I know you've mentioned that um, the IEs are 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 make campaigning difficult. I would ask that you um, call for the end of negative mm. campaigning through the end of the election. Is, I, I don't I know, know if there's any way control, to respond to that, but I want to make sure that could, yeah. So. So, in fact, along those lines, the first, yeah. the first thing I wanted to say is it's just important for people to know that, you know, because, a, you know, because a PAC endorses me doesn't mean anything more than they like my, what I'm talking about. Okay. And they want to see the change that I represent, mm -hmm. but that they haven't bought and paid for me. They haven't influenced me in any way at all. They just, you know, we fill out a questionnaire, we send it in, and that is across the board, whether yeah. it's the Alliance for Gun Responsibility sure. or for teachers or the carpenter or whoever it is, you know, the downtown chamber, we just go through this process, yeah. and when they pick a candidate, they support that candidate. And yeah. as far as negative campaigning, I mean, I agree. If they, if they want to point out decisions that an incumbent has made that they don't agree with, if they want to point out the fact that they want to see change because they think the city's going in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. fine. And, you know, I agree. I know everybody pointed out, like, the first piece that came yeah. out, um, you know, they chose, like, the worst picture possible. Yeah. And, you know, it's things like this where I see it and I feel like, look, yeah. if you want to make your point about real 
issues and what's going on and why they want to see change, fine, yep. but to keep it as clean as they possibly can. I mean, Thank you, you very know. much. I want to make sure we cover that because I know a lot of people are talking about it. Phil, let me jump to you. I want to break down a local issue, really big one for yeah. West Seattle. District 1, we're talking about light rail. I know you both have been supportive of a tunnel option, but I want to break this down. This realistic plan for Sound Transit in terms of getting light rail built, talking about 2026, I sure hope that happens. I live in West Seattle, full disclosure. But maybe there are some additional costs if that's involved. Let's talk about yeah. that. Your thoughts about it, Phil? Well, I mean, look, we have to have the tunnel. I mean, this is something that will affect West Seattle for many generations to come. Yeah. Um, you know, this is not something that would be precedented, putting this giant raised thing coming yeah. through our neighborhood, because it would disrupt the neighborhood. It would change the character of West Seattle, and it would have a negative impact to have this giant thing running down the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I think Lisa and I are both exactly on the same page that we want to see this supported. And plus, at this point, it's so early in the planning process, we've been told, you know, they're only 5% in, in terms of determining the actual right. cost. Right. So we can't even say right now how much more it is and where we'd need to find that money. But I'm yeah. glad that we're on the same page with Very that. good point. And, and maybe, Lisa, you can, uh, your two cents, or it might be $700 million, depending <laughs> on how this tunnel, tunnel goes. <laughs> well but well, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about that. This tunnel, it's a big issue mm -hmm. for a lot of people. It absolutely Seattle. is. And uh, as a member of Sound Transit, elected leaders group. Yeah. Um, I advocated strongly uh, for um, not only um, a tunnel uh, to serve the junction, mm -hmm. but also um, a tunnel to um, avoid um, disruption, similar disruption in the Del Ridge neighborhood. Right, right, right. And, um, you know, we got um, we got the elected leaders group to make recommendations mm -hmm. that they were they were re ready to take off the table. So yeah. the blue line, yeah, right. they were ready to take that off the table. Yeah. But we, um, I, um, directed, um, or I made a motion to direct sure. um, Sound Transit, which was supported by mm -hmm. other members, to redesign it so it doesn't go through the golf course as much. Yeah. Um, likewise, on the Del Ridge Tunnel, we yeah. um, got agreement to consider it as a possible um, alternative. Yeah. Um, it's not being analyzed to the same level that the other um, options are being analyzed. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to sort of do a pre-analysis of it. And they're okay. going to be announcing that within the next couple weeks. Okay. So we'll know whether or not that option moves forward. As it relates to the money, um, we have to use this time yeah. the, um, where we're doing the EIS, the Environmental mm -hmm. Impact Statement, right. to create the political will yeah. among not just uh, third funders, but fourth funders, fifth yeah. funders, and sixth funders yeah. to come together to um, to fund a program that really meets the needs of the community. Let me branch off that a little bit, and Phil, I'll bring in here. On that glorious day when Light Rail does come to West Seattle, yes. I know we're going to be talking about managing growth yet again, right. and I want to talk about that. Mandatory housing affordability, the other tools that the city has, are they working right now? Do we need new tools in place? Well, I think we need to adjust the tools that we're trying to put in place, like the mandatory housing affordability up zone. The fee, the in lieu of fees need to be higher. I mean, we talk about the fact that if a developer is going to come to a neighborhood and build housing, that they need to either include affordable housing within that project or pay an in lieu of fee into a pile that not-for-profit developers can access. Mm -hmm. The fee is way too small. It would be, it is far too easy for a developer just to, just to choose to opt out with a check that really isn't going to be all that beneficial. Yeah. And then the other thing that has to happen is that money needs to stay in the neighborhood that took the development. And right now, MHA just basically asks for developers to do that or for the money to stick in that neighborhood, but there's no there's no teeth behind it. There's no forcing that money yeah. to at least have something along the lines of a right of first refusal for a certain amount of time. That money is there for a project in the neighborhood that took that added development. Yeah. And so that needs to be changed. And yeah. we also really have to talk about doing a better job preserving our affordable stock. Yeah. Because MHA, if you talk to a small landlord that has a small apartment, they're yeah. getting contacted weekly by de developers chomping at the bit sure. to take that place, raise it up, make a lot more money, and we lose all of our affordable housing stock. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, uh, thoughts about other tools that might be needed for urban sure. growth? You know what's going to keep happening in West I, Seattle. Um, I really hope that I can uh, get the support of Phil um, <laughs> as it relates to my legislation to require mm. one-for-one -one replacement mm. of affordable housing that is demolished yeah, right. um, uh, in exchange for new development. Um, my legislation would require uh, a 
landlord or a property owner to uh, replace the housing that is affordable that they remove when they have a new building. Um, that could serve two different purposes. It could serve the purpose of either replacing the housing or the pr other purpose it could serve is it could encourage a developer to develop in another place, yeah. uh, maintaining the existing housing yeah. uh, at where it is serving yeah. the people that it is currently serving. Okay. As it relates specifically to, to MHA, um, I agree we have to monitor um, the collection of the, uh, the mandatory fees yeah. that uh, property owners pay. Mm -hmm. um, and we will have to turn the dial if we see not enough housing being produced on site in location. Our goal is to have 50% of developers building the affordable housing in their buildings and 50% uh, contributing in lieu. If we're not meeting that goal, then we're going to have to turn the fee up yeah. to make the fee less attractive. Thank you. I would love to squeeze in, if I can, the 20-second version. That issue you're hearing about when you're campaigning that maybe we haven't talked about yet. I know there are no small issues out there for voters. Phil, is there something that's been brought up or you'd like to champion? I mean, I, so one of the biggest things are public safety concerns. Um, and we are seeing a rise in property crimes. We're seeing a rise in violent crimes. Um, I, on the doors, I talk to a lot of people that just see an element around West Seattle that's creeping in that they had never seen before. Yeah. You know, having to worry about needles in alleyways where they've never had that problem. Worrying about seeing people who are trying to break into cars and yeah. break into houses. And this is something that we need to address citywide. And this ends up, you know, going hand in hand with our issues with the police and supporting them better. Right. And so, yeah, I, f for me, that public safety piece is huge because if we don't, I mean, four years ago we were talking about it and it's gotten worse. And if we don't really address it now, I think we're going to see a real problem coming up. Lisa, if you can try to keep it short, if, if you can. Sure. That, that small um, issue out there, it's, smaller. I don't yeah. think it's a small issue, but no. it's um, an issue that we're not talking enough about. Um, and it's specifically um, the displacement of um, seniors. Yeah, okay. uh, We have a lot of folks in West Seattle who have, families have lived there for generations. Yeah. Yeah. The ability to um, stay housed in um, the the homes that they've lived in for um for decades is really okay. difficult for seniors, and okay. we need to find ways to make it more possible for, so people can age in place. Thank you. We're going to wrap up here. Uh, Lisa, if you wouldn't mind helping out voters out there, why should they be voting for you? Sure. So we're going to have a lot of um, turnover on the city council, uh, no matter what happens. We have at least four new um, council members coming um, in uh, January, and mm -hmm. I think it's really important for West Seattle to be represented by somebody who has the experience. Um, and um, has um, the um, the reputation is working really hard on behalf of her constituents. Okay. I have the endorsements of MLK Labor, mm -hmm. uh, King County Labor Council, the 34th District mm -hmm. Democrats, um, okay. as well as uh, the 11th District, Pramila Jayapal, mm -hmm. Joe McDermott, um, okay. and a whole bunch of other community members that I'm really, really pleased that I have their support. And Thank I you very much. Uh, Phil, I'm going to give you the last word. I mean, the direction of this city right now is not what anybody wants to see. Um, over the last four years, none of the things we talked about in 2015 have gotten better. And to that extent, we need change. We need new leadership. We need new people. We need new people with, with new experiences. Um, we don't have a business owner on city council. Um, like I said, for 15 years, I've been involved with the criminal justice system as a public defender, helping the people that don't have a voice and who aren't being helped. We need someone who understands all of the elements of the criminal justice system and how to better effectively use it. You know, and as I see in the community, you know, I'm, I'm now endorsed by more than 100 small businesses, and that's because they want someone who's there every day, who listens to them, who will listen to everybody in the community, and who's going to fight for an honest change with accountability and real results. And we need that. And so I think Seattle can do better, and I think I bring to the table the experiences and the skill set that we need to do it. All right. Thank you both very much. And we will be right back. <laughs> Homeless to everybody. I think everybody needs to be accounted for and cared for. First of all, you should you need to have a place for them to go. Nurses, teachers, construction workers, they should be able to live in the city they built. I think we should expand the light rail as far as we can. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Before we close today, it's time for our weekly CIO poll. What's your chief concern in District 1? Homelessness, affordability, transportation, or something else? We want to know what you think. Cast your vote and weigh in with your comments at our website, seattlechannel.org slash cityinsideout. While you're there, you can watch our programs online anytime. 
Coming up next week, our election coverage continues with Council District 2. Tammy Morales and Mark Solomon are both vying to represent Georgetown and Southeast Seattle for the next four years. Watch them debate here next time on City Inside Out. I hope you join us.